We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to Accelerating Change. I'm Jeff Tun, the founder of the Indie CIO Network, and we are very excited for Bell Tech Logics to be sponsoring for the fourth year in a row one of our Indie CIO dinner events. Although given this year, dinner is a little bit different. But we are so glad that you could make it uh, this evening and carve some time out to join us for what promises to be an outstanding program. Today we are joined by three stellar groups from around central Indiana. The Indy CIO Network, the IT Leaders Group, and Women in High Tech. I believe this is the first time these three organizations have met together in one session. So this is a fantastic opportunity to meet each other and learn from each other. Just a brief commercial on the Indy CIO Network for those of you who may be new to that organization. We are a group of about 300 Central Indiana CIOs and senior IT leaders from a wide variety of organizations spread across all types of industries. We are very excited to have you jo be joining with us tonight. If you'd like more information on the Indy CIO Network, you can visit www.indc.io and get some information. Would love to have you join us. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our host for this evening from Bell Tech Logics, Jack Mansfield. So, Jack. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to join uh, this group again and to uh, welcome the other groups as well to uh, to this. Uh, dinner webinar, as it were. Um, as Jeff said, we are with uh, Bell Tech Logics. Uh, many of you know who we are. Uh, we are an IT managed services company. Um, happy to be represented in the Gartner Magic Quadrant for managed workplace services. Uh, won't spend too much talking uh, time talking about us because the person you're really here uh, to hear from is uh, Pippa Mann. You know, I've been very uh, fortunate to have the opportunity uh, to know Pippa for several years. Uh, she is a, uh, a a race driver that has been uh, sponsored uh, by Bell Tech Logics for for a number of years uh, and raced in races including the uh, the, the Indy 500. Um, uh, we're happy to have uh, uh, Pippa here tonight. Talk a little bit about uh, how she's thrived in a uh, in an industry that has been uh, uh, dominated traditionally by uh, uh, by men. And uh, uh, Pippa, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Jack, um, and thank you, Bell Tech Logics, for having me. Thank you, Indie CIO Network, for having me as your speaker tonight. Uh, to get one of the formalities out of the way real quick, obviously this is a little different than usual. Everybody's watching from home. Um, I'm also effectively working from home this evening and this is just a little forewarning. Um, I do have a foster dog in the house. He has been extremely restless for the past few hours. I'm hoping he's going to be good and quiet for us while I'm uh, speaking to you guys this evening, but just in case you suddenly hear a dog start barking on my screens, Hopefully all of those of you who have pets at home and are working from home can kind of understand how that might happen. So I wanted to start my talk by talking about something that actually doesn't really have anything to do with me except how it influenced me. Over 40 years ago, a woman called Janet Guthrie attempted to qualify for the Indianapolis 500. She was the first female racer ever to attempt to compete at a race at that level. The articles that were written in the press about Janet over 40 years ago, you can only imagine the things that were being said about her. But it wasn't just the press. She was being demeaned and degraded by her fellow competitors. She was being called names by the fans in the stands. There were certain racetracks where Janet was not allowed in the pits. Apparently you guys have a problem with my internet connection. Jeff, have you still got me? We are hearing you, Pippa. It's just your video is cutting out. So just keep keep rolling. And keep rolling. We, we are able to hear you just fine. Okay, fantastic. So Janet was absolutely determined. She had all of the qualifications 
And she found a team who was willing to take the risk, willing to take the chance to attempt to run her at the Indianapolis 500. And all the time, she just wanted to be a driver, right? To her, her gender was actually this sort of inconvenient thing that was causing a problem in what she wanted to go about doing. At the same time, she was very aware of the pressure being a woman was putting her under. She understood more than anyone that if she failed, if she crashed, if she was not fast enough, what that would mean for the future of women in motorsport as the first woman trying to do this. 1976 was year one for Janet Guthrie at the Indianapolis 500. She did not qualify. She did not have enough funding and her car was not fast enough. However, she earned the respect of her fellow competitors to the degree that A.J. Foyt let Janet get in his backup car and go out on one of the practice days to prove she was fast enough to qualify for the Indianapolis 500 if she had the correct equipment. 1977 was year two for Janet Guthrie. She was still in very poor equipment on a shoestring budget, but this year there was less negativity surrounding her attempt to qualify for the race, and she made it in that race. Her engine let go on race day, but she had already achieved something that had never been done before. 1978, year three for Janet Guthrie at the Indianapolis 500. And in her third year at the Indianapolis 500, with a slightly better budget and slightly better equipment, she came home with a top 10 finish. Now, if just a couple of years ago, it was unheard of that a woman should even attempt to qualify, you can kind of imagine the reaction to now a woman bringing home a top 10 finish in the biggest automotive race in the world. Year four for Janet Guthrie at the Indianapolis 500. There wasn't one. After coming home in the top 10 in her third year, in 1978, in 1979, Janet Guthrie was unable to raise the sponsorship to return to the Indianapolis 500. It fell on her to go out there and try and raise the money. Other people didn't really want to work with her to try and raise the funding for the same reason that sponsors were refusing to sponsor her. Despite this record from the previous three years, Janet was viewed as too big of a risk. She was viewed as too polarizing. Companies didn't want to be involved in case it went wrong. What would happen to them if their brand was attached to a car being driven by a woman and she crushed? What would happen if she got hurt and their brand was attached to that? But this was 40 years ago. And in 40 years, so much has changed in the world of motorsport. But sadly, so much also hasn't. The year is 2020 right now, and I've competed seven times at the Indianapolis 500, but I've never had enough sponsorship to show up and do the two days of practice that everyone else gets at the beginning of May. I've never been able to raise enough sponsorship to go and do any practice at all before I turn up for opening day at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Every year, that's the first time I have strapped myself into the cockpit of an IndyCar in 12 months minus two weeks because it's two weeks for the month of May. That's it, nothing else, show up and go. I'm a pole winner at Indianapolis Motor Speedway in an Indy Lights car, the feeder series to IndyCar. And I'm a proven race winner in that series too. Yet in 2011, the year after I won pole at IMS and I became a proven race winner in Indy Lights, there were so many questions about why the team owner who signed me would risk putting me in his car. What, why would you take on somebody who didn't deserve to be there? Why would you take on somebody who hadn't earned the right to have a shot to qualify for the Indianapolis 500? It must be about money, they said. She, she's a girl. She must have raised plenty of money. I'm the only female race car driver to have turned a 230 mile per hour lap at Indianapolis Motor Speedway in the history of the Speedway. There have been many eras of Indy cars, some faster, some slower, and I've been lucky enough to, you know, be in one of the faster eras of Indy car when I got to turn that 230 lap. 
Yet, in qualifying of that year, when I went out and ran an average lap time of 229.7 miles per hour, and it gave me my best ever qualifying, which for the equipment I was in, was just outside the top 20 in 23rd place, was a really great qualifying effort and something we were absolutely thrilled with as the four lap average. There was an entire thread started on the internet by two or three other drivers who initiated it. These actually weren't IndyCar drivers, I'd like to make that clear, but two or three other drivers who initiated. And the entire thread was based upon the fact that I wasn't fast enough. 230 miles an hour, not fast enough. I've only ever competed at the Indianapolis 500 on a really small shoestring budget. Budgets the, the big teams won't even pay attention to, that they, do, they don't want on their team for that kind of money. And yet with that budget, in the equipment we've been able to put together, the past three times I've been in an IndyCar and Indianapolis 500 race day, I've come home in the top 20. That's a big day for some of the teams I've been running with and for some of the equipment I've been in. And quite frankly, it's a big day for some girl who last sat in an IndyCar 12 months ago before the start of the two weeks of May. And yet, the conversation will continuously revolve around whether I'm actually good enough. Have you noticed how in 2020, this conversation about whether I'm good enough, whether I'm fast enough, whether I belong, whether I deserve to be there, whether I should have a shot. It's very interesting. Nobody wants to bring up the core word of the gender. Now, if my name was Philip and I had all these same results and I did all these same things, none of this would actually even be a conversation for the most part. But because of my gender it is, and yet everybody who wants to have this conversation will tell you outright that it has nothing to do with my gender. I'm simply not good enough. I don't belong to be there. One of the things that's really interesting is in 2020, there are very much three types of teams in racing. And at the Indianapolis 500 at the IndyCar level, this rings absolutely true. The first type of team is my favorite. The first type of team is the type of team who's actually already run a female driver, whether it's me or someone else. And they know that we're just race car drivers, right? We show up, we get the job done. And normally because of the amount of uh, other stuff outside of the car we put up with, we're fairly well equipped to deal with the pressures that come with being in a race car and the mud people sling it, all race car drivers and athletes of whatever level. So those are my favorite types of teams. My second favorite types of teams are the ones that haven't had a female race car driver ever as part of their stable, but they're cautious, but they're willing to try. And the wonderful thing about working with those types of teams is normally after you get through the first day of working with all of these new people, everybody settles down and realizes that this is just another race car driver who's possibly even more determined to get the job done than some of the boys they've worked with and things settle down. Unfortunately, there is still a third type of team. And that is the type of team who will not have a female race car driver. Now they may tell you it has nothing to do with my gender. They may tell you it's because I'm not good enough. They may tell you it's because I wasn't able to raise enough money. They may tell you it's because I don't deserve to be there that my results don't merit it. One of the teams I actually spoke to earlier this year. One of these teams is still not ready to take on a female race car driver. How do I know that? Because when I have conversations with them, while this is never the subject of the conversation, I know that I'm being patronized and I'm not being taken seriously. And then I have to step back and look at the situation. I think, I have enough battles to fight. Is this really somewhere where I want to try and go and drive a race car if I'm not sure that you're ready to have me on your team? Is this going to be too great of a hurdle to overcome? I also look at it as, can I bring enough people with me who have done this with me before that sort of, we whitewash over your issues you have over there pretty quickly and, you know, we can instill this new climate into your team from the ground up. But I'll be honest with you, it is a ton of hard work to walk into a race team and do that. 
2020, we also have social media. I told you a little bit about the media that Janet faced when she was racing. In 2020, social media is the big thing. Everybody has access to the internet. Everybody has access to this outlet. Everybody has an opinion and most of them believe they're experts and they're not scared to share their opinions. As a female driver, I am incredibly lucky and very thankful that I do get a large amount of support. At the same time, there is a very loud minority out there who feels incredibly strongly and is very, very good at making their voices heard. The media itself in 2020 also still is working through some of their bias. You're not going to see the media publish an article about whether a woman should be there based upon her gender anymore, but they're very, very scared about writing the wrong thing about us in case people say they wrote it because we're a woman. This swings both towards things that go wrong and things that go right. And sadly, for the journalists whom aren't scared about whether they get it right or wrong. There are just as many who possibly still live in the era 40 years ago when Janet Guthrie was attempting to qualify. And they're trying to find more palatable ways to say the same things as those whom are prepared to write the real story about how hard the work is and how hard I've dug to get there and whether I'm actually qualified to be on track. The other thing you've heard me say time and time again through this is I've talked about the shoestring and the shoestring budget that I've been on. So here's the deal. We live in 2020, but when I'm trying to chase sponsorship to go and compete at the Indianapolis 500, I am still viewed as a risk. What happens if a sponsor is associated with me, a girl, and I crash the car with their logos on the car? What's going to happen if a sponsor is associated with me and has their logos all over my car and I get hurt? I'm a racing driver. I have the, the potential for me to get hurt is unfortunately part of my job. And it's something that I accepted a long time ago and it's something that I continue to accept. But for a sponsor, they view it differently. If someone who looks like me gets hurt as opposed to someone called Phil. I'm still viewed as polarizing. I mentioned that vocal minority on social media. Boy, do they make their voices heard. These days when a sponsor does research on a racing driver, it's not just about what I do and what I say and what I do on my social media accounts and how I carry myself and how I uh, comport myself. Um, it's not just about my results on the racetrack and whether I'm qualified to be there and what I've done. They also review what other people say about you. And there's nothing that I can actually do to control that. So if I get through the door of a big name sponsor and they start doing a deep dive on me, these red flags pop up that I have no control over that I can do nothing about because I'm still viewed as a polarizing figure. I'm going to go back to this again. It's 2020. But in 2020, coming off my best result in the Indianapolis 500 in 2019, if we called an Indianapolis 500 in August of 2020, I don't know yet whether I'm going to have the opportunity to be in a racing car or whether I'm going to be watching the racing cars going around and around the racetrack. It's potentially going to be the first Indianapolis 500 in 20 years without a female athlete competing. 20 years. In 2019, ESPN did a documentary on Janet Guthrie's attempts at the Indianapolis 500, and it was appropriately titled Qualified, because she was. In 2019, Janet Guthrie was finally inducted into the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Hall of Fame over 40 years later, in 2019. But in 2020, if there is no female athlete at the Indianapolis 500, 
they will tell you it is not about gender. They will tell you it's because there's nobody qualified. Wow. Pippa, thank you very much. Um, you know, I uh, certainly was moved by, by uh, your comments there. And, uh, you know, certainly I, I'm proud to be part of an organization that knows that you are qualified. And it's <laughs> very, uh, you. very proud to be a, uh, be a sponsor and, and be associated with you for, for years now. Um, um, but you know that that the, the topic of you know you know being you know being included and 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 the, and the, the topic of in, inclusion does ra raise quite a few questions. Um, you know I, I think we're going to open up uh, some Q and A now and move to the, the the panel side of our of our presentation. Um, but, you know, as a part of that, I will uh, re uh, remind all the participants, that, or not all the participants, all the attendees, um, that as a part of Zoom, you have the ability to submit questions, uh, Q&A through the uh, um, through the Q&A function uh, of the Zoom webinar. So I've got my eye open here as people uh, may have questions um, that they um, they want to submit and have our have our panelist uh, uh, panelists cover. But uh, I will take this time to introduce uh, the panelists that you see. Uh, depending on how it's arranged on your screen, uh, they might be up here or down there or all all around. But uh, I, I will introduce them now. Um, uh, happy to have with me also from Bell Tech Logics, uh, Amy Hall. Amy is uh, Vice President of Human Resources. Um, also with us is. Uh, Angela Freeman. Angela is the president of uh, Women in High Tech. Uh, and she is a uh, IP and patent attorney attorney with Barnes and Thornburg. Uh, Holly Harrington, uh, who's the director director of supplier diversity uh, with the Indianapolis Airport Authority and a board member of the uh, City County Information Technology Board. Uh, and then also with us uh, we have uh, Lori Ball. Uh, Lori is the chief operating officer for bio IVT. Um, and again, thank you for joining us uh, tonight for this, for this panel. Um, so, you know, I guess I'll start by, you know, turning to you, uh, Angela, um, you know, you know, you've had, you know, quite, you know, quite a career and working with, uh, with Barnes and Thornburg, you know, how does an organization, you know, start that process to build a, an understanding of what equity and what inclusion looks like? Yeah. So can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Um, so, so first, I'd like to just start off by thanking Bell Tech Logics and NDCIO Network for having me and Women in High Tech this evening. Um, we're we're excited to be with you all. Um, for me, I think that um, if, if you want to be serious about equity inclusion as a corporate entity or a some type of corporate entity, whether for profit or nonprofit. Um, you have to have a diversity statement, and in my view, even a diversity officer. There needs to be someone who is accountable for um, what the corporation values and, and, and initiatives are around DNI, equity and inclusion, and such. Um, with women in high tech, um, we've uh, included a diversity statement in our mission statement. So we've made it very clear that diversity, equity, and inclusion are important to um, promoting women in STEM, not just um, majority women, but all women. Um, and, and that's made clear in our mission statement. So in my mind, you need at least that, um, a mission statement, a diversity statement, and then someone, quite frankly, to make sure that that mission statement is implemented throughout the company and organization. Thanks, Angela. And then, uh, um, Holly, you look like you might have some thoughts that you were wanting. I saw you kind of look like you were jotting some thoughts as Angela uh, was talking there. Did you have something you wanted to share? Um, I just wanted to say, again, thank you for having me. Um, and in this time, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion is, is critical for our success. You know, when you prep for these type of things, you have all the notes and all the right things you want to say. And then um, I felt like I was in church um, listening to 
Pippa and it just kind of took me down, you know, a whole nother trail. And one of the things I think um, um, you should always think of is we, we got to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. So just listening to her, my notes were, am I good enough in 2020? You know, she talked about, am I qualified? Um, right. And my other note was, it's not okay in 2020 for women to still wonder, am I good enough? And am I qualified? And oftentimes, um, other people have to speak for us to um, validate us. So as she was speaking, you know, my over 25 year history, it just resonated. So one of the things I'm very proud of is in the, with the airport, um, there's a lot of value in people first, you know, and not just the passengers that come through our airport, but the leadership team and our board really values the people. That's what makes the airport. Um, not the planes and the terminal and everything else, but it's the positive experiences we create. And what is pivotal, pivot, you have to feel like you can bring your best self to work. Yeah. And if you can't bring your, your best self to work, it doesn't matter. So while the mission statements are great and the policies are awesome, if it's not what you experience, That's right. um, when you go in, um, those those words mean mean nothing and so i know a lot of people put quotes out there people don't remember your titles and as my angelo people remember how you make them feel and so i think in organizations there has to be a genuine commitment to want people to bring their best and seeing people seeing that value and then that becomes the fiber that makes up an organization. And when we, as women, are affiliated with organizations that really believe in that, we thrive. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. You know, that, that that's a really good point, you know, and, and, you know, having some of those organizations, you know, here in, in attendance, you know, is, uh, it, you know, speaking of being in church, we're almost preaching to the choir a little bit. But, uh, you know, from that perspective, you know, it is 2020, right? And, you know, some things have have not changed. But, uh, you know, I guess I would ask, you know, have, have things changed along the way around sort of that perception of, of equity? Have things changed around the meaning of, of inclusion? Um, are, are the barriers uh, the the same or are are they different now as we as we've moved, you know, you know throughout your career. Yeah, Lori. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll, I'll take this one. So uh, I probably arguably have the most gray hair of this group anyway. So I probably uh, had the potential of seeing the most change, right? <laughs> so. Uh, back to Pippa's comments for, for a second. My very first Indianapolis 500 was when I got to hear lady and gentlemen start your engine. So I remember Janet Guthrie and um, just seeing something that is different in your lens does start to change and does start a ripple. And so I, I think that Pippa, you are a ripple starter as well. You know, you are standing up, your voice is being heard, your helmet is seen in that car. Um, you are having those negotiations with teams. And even in the, in the case when you aren't able to secure a sponsorship with a team or with a company, you have forever changed their perception of a woman driver. And so you are greasing the, the paths. And so I guess that's, that's kind of how I would answer this question is, I've been a recipient of women and, and minorities uh, along the way. And even when I look at my career path, it, it doesn't look like there's been a lot of progress, right? Um, but you know, I have lived in the world of Title IX in college athletics and higher education. My first career was in uh, college athletics. So I could talk all day long about the disparities in budgets and travel and uniforms and amenities and all those things. But what I've seen now is um, I have I, I have seen a, a shift for priorities in business. 
and and there are different entry points in business. Uh, some see it as a social responsibility to be nice to the women, and some see social responsibility to to be nice uh, to uh, multiple races, what, whatever their agenda is. But but there's there has been a new equation that has entered the workforce and that is that when you have women on your boards and in your key leadership positions you are more profitable as a company so even if you don't get philosophical agreement there's financial agreement that when you have women participate you are more profitable and so uh, I, I hear the same things and I've heard the same things that Pippa was describing in the racing world. Uh, there are no qualified women. I would hire one if I could see one. I would interview one if I could find one. And, and so those are the comments you get. I'm not against women. I would, I would interview one. Um, but I would submit that, that we're in this awkward time of how do you gain experience? when you aren't given those opportunities but how do you risk as a company when you don't have those experience and so in in my world and i've been a recipient and i've tried to pass that along is we need to hire on potential we really need to hire on potential um, not all the time do you need that experience but but when i have hired on potential and taken a chance I've rarely been disappointed, whether it be men, women, minorities, whatever we're talking about, because potential and talent wins. They find a way to win. They find a way to overcome. And so until we have that bucket of experience, potential has to be the answer. Well, th thank you, Lori. You know, one of the things you said right there at the beginning was, you know, he hearing that phrase at the racetrack, right? the lady and gentleman start your engines. You know, I just kind of raised in my mind, you know, the, the, the concept of, you know, uh, uh, of unconscious bias, right? The phrase gentlemen start your engine, which is, has been a tradition for so long, you know, inherently has some, you know, unconscious, unintentional bias that it, that it, car that, that it carried with it. And ha being able to recognize that and change it as, as the dynamic has changed has been, you know, really important. Um, you know, uh, you know. I, I guess, Amy, I'm gonna just flip the the conversation, give you a chance to talk for us uh, and address something. Um, you know, you know, we know everybody has some of these unconscious biases. You know, you know, what role do you see those biases playing out, and you know, how can we, you know, really uh, bring those forward and really kind of address that in a professional environment? Yeah, thank you, Jack. Um, you know, I, I love this question because I think um, this pertains to everyone, regardless of, you know, race, gender, background, socioeconomic status, whatever. We all have them. Uh, we all have these biases. Um, some call them unconscious bias. You've, I've also um, heard it called implicit bias. Um, of course, I'm in HR, so where I see this the most in the workplace, um, and, and to be honest, I think that this is uh, where most people would see this uh, in the workplace the most is in recruiting, um, coaching, performance management. We see a lot of these things. I'm going to focus in on recruiting a little bit um, because we tend to be doing a lot of that these days. I know it's a, it, this war on talent is, is a very real thing. Um, but I think we, we can very easily slip into, um, you know, our, our, our comfy PJs, right? So it's um, when you're interviewing somebody, we just naturally are drawn to somebody who either looks like us or has an experience like us. Oh, Jack, you like to, you like to go fishing? Me too. Oh, Jack, this is your, you know, favorite restaurant. Oh, Jack, you know, this is the church you go to. Me too, right? So we kind of fall into these really comfortable zones of making these connections that have nothing to do with, you know, finding the right talent, bringing the right person into the fold. Um, it, we also, you know, when we speak about bias, kind of in a general way, this isn't just related to recruiting. We think about, um, I'll just kind of name some off. Um, 
blonde, blonde women are flighty. I mean, you know, I have some blonde hair guy. I, I don't think I'm too flighty, but um, blonde women are flighty. Um, men are better leaders. I think this just kind of goes back to what, you know, Lori has talk, talked about and, and Pippa and others. It's, is that, is that really true? I mean, is it just because we're afraid? Is it because of what Holly said? We're saying, are we enough? I mean, I can't tell you how many times, honestly, even in the role I'm in, I've asked, am I qualified for this role? You know, this guy over here that I know, who's um, in a, the exact role as me at another company, is he better qualified than me? And I think we have um, those questions and, and we bring those to work. We bring those biases to work. We bring those insecurities to work. Um, how, do we, how do we counteract or combat them? I think first of all, it's really important. And I would say this is important, not just for combating bias, but it's also important for building a culture of um, you know, inclusion is really understanding and kind of doing a, a real, true, authentic look at equity in your workplace. You, you can build the best, um, you know, value statement. You can build the best diversity and inclusion, you know, um, if, you know champion the, the best group. But if you aren't really taking a look at equity in your organization first, um, which I think points out bias, unconscious bias, um, then it won't, n none of your efforts around diversity and inclusion will be sustainable. They just, they just won't. Um, I have these biases as well. You do too. I think the best thing we can do is not just as you know, organizations, but just as individuals is challenge those and get comfortable. I know we're going to talk a little bit about this in another question, but get comfortable getting uncomfortable, right? It's saying, hey, Amy, why did you want to hire Lori? You know, well, what was it about Lori? Well, Lori and I used to work together. Lori is, you know, Lori um, likes some of the same things I like. Obviously, I'm not going to say those things in, in a, as I'm giving feedback, but do I unconsciously have a bias for this person because of the experiences I've had? Probably. So we really have to say, okay, Amy, what are, what are we really, what are we looking for here? And do I have a bias that I need to, be aware of and um, it's okay to have an uncomfortable conversation and say do you have a bias you know that's I think you have to have a trust level with people to kind of to push back and ask those questions but they are they are critical to ask they're very important to ask we will not push this agenda forward of um, having equitable workplaces and, and increasing diversity and inclusion and making it worthwhile if we aren't you know are asking those tough questions Jack, can I just make a statement based on what Amy just said? I, I think you're exactly right. And I think oftentimes even the label of unconscious bias is a bias. In other words, what Pippa's talking about is conscious bias that is being labeled as unconscious bias because we're uncomfortable with calling a spade a spade, right? or we don't think people will believe us. Um, going back to Holly's point of, I just got out of church, absolutely. When Pippa said her comments, my thought was, well, my goodness, if that's what she's going through, imagine what I deal with, or a Holly deals with, or a Lori deals with. This is real, you know? And it's not unconscious bias a whole lot of times. You can deal with unconscious bias. People who are unconsciously biased, they want to learn. They want to get better. They want to know why they offended you. Why didn't you like that comment? People who know exactly what they're doing, they don't care that it hurts your feelings. They don't care that you feel excluded. And to give them the label of unconscious bias is being too nice. It is not unconscious. Some people know exactly what they're doing. And, and I want us to have those un uncomfortable conversations and challenge each other to, so why do you like Lori? You know why? Because when I look at her resume, I, I don't see what Susie has over here. So explain to me why you're so gung-ho on Lori. And, and those are real conversations that do get uncomfortable. 
but but need to be had if we're going to hold each other accountable for real equity inclusion and not just the statement that in reality is not being lived day to day and from management level to management. So I have a funny story on this, if I could sort of jump in for a moment. Um, and I'm going to do the racing driver thing and lighten the tone by lowering it a little bit. But this is a true story. Um, and it's about one of my mechanics at last year's Indianapolis 500. He was a great guy. He was so excited to be part of our team and be on my car. And he had never worked with a female driver before, but you never felt for him that was in any way, shape or form of an issue until we got to the moment where for the first time he realized he was going to be one of the people strapping me in. Now, if you've ever looked down inside the cockpit of an Indy car, you have a lap belt. So this kind of comes over your hip bones and it cinches up sort of low down on your stomach. Along with your lap belt, you have shoulder straps. So shoulder straps come down over your shoulders and come down there. You have crotch straps. Crotch straps literally come up in between your legs and connect to the lap belts. Now, all of these belts have to be done nice and tightly and kind of done properly to, you know, get the job done. And, you know, let's be honest, there's a backdrop of me too out there and I work in an industry where guys literally have to put their hands on me to keep me safe. So we rolled out the first time on the pit lane and his name's TJ. TJ is awesome, by the way. Um, and TJ is sort of fumbling around, struggling to strap me in. And he sort of kind of makes, you know, an attempt. And I'm like looking at him and I'm like, no, 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 come over here. I'm like, and, and that's telling him I want him to pull down harder on my shoulder straps and like get me really tightly strapped in. Because when you're in a single seater car, you're wedged in so tightly on your shoulders that you can't do it yourself, unlike in a sports car, which is the other environment TJ normally works in. So I've like called him back, like do it again. And he came back and he like did a little more. And I'm like, no, 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 c c come back. Like, because TJ can't hear me on the uh, intercom at this point, and I don't need to broadcast this on the radio that everybody can tune into. Anyway, we, we make it through the rest of the session, and we get back to the garage, and then we go out to pit lane, and it happened again. And so after this time, we got back to the garage, and I'm like, hey, TJ, come over here. I said to him, look, I said to him, how many dudes have you strapped in in your career? And he's like, a lot. And I'm like, right. Men have stuff in between their legs I'm pretty sure you're uncomfortable touching too. I phrased it slightly differently because he's a mechanic and we have slightly coarser language at the racetrack, but you can imagine what I, I actually said to him. I said, look, how many of those have you touched and you haven't wanted to, but you've had to to strap a dude in? He's like, uh, I'm like, right, can we get with the program, please? And from that moment on, he had no problem strapping me in. So it's so, so a funny story about unconscious bias and somebody who genuinely wanted to learn and didn't want to offend me, but... You know, for a moment there, I had to really encourage him to do his job to help keep me safe because he was worried that what it might mean for him if, you know, he had to do that. Um, but, but we got it figured out. <laughs> it's a great story. Uh, I, got, I got a comment here from uh, well, one of the attendees who, um, you know, since, you know, this is the, you know, the NDCIO network here, wanted to know if we could kind of take some of this conversation around um, bias, you know, against women and having to prove you're good enough and really make a connection and or an extension specifically into the technology field. Yeah, um, I'm happy to take that. And Lori, I know you've got experience in this too. So I think your points would be, would be really valid. Um, you know, this, this is a real thing, right? Uh, and I, ha I have to tell you, um, imagine, I mean, me, com I'm coming into, a, I've been with, with Valtech Logics two years. Um, so coming into a human resources role in a managed services IT environment, uh, and oh, by the way, I'm a, a woman. Um, so I feel like this, this comment is, is speaking to me. This was, this was me uh, so many days. And to be honest, two years in, Still is me some days, but I will tell you, um, I gotta tell you, I, do, I think a lot of this issue is with me internally because um, it's almost like I expect men and or women in, in my space and the field I'm in and the, in the organization I'm in to 
um, have certain feelings about me because I'm a woman in, in the IT space when in reality, I, I'm, I'm encouraged, I'm supported um, by men and women in my organization. Um, so while I certainly real recognize and realize that this is a, a very real thing, I, some of my experience is really kind of me saying, wait a minute, Amy, um, is this an internal thing where you've got some expectations of yourself or you're really dealing with in a, a, maybe a, a, I don't, a self-esteem issue where you're really, it's that, it's that am I good enough and worthy enough to be in this role, to be in this space, to be next to Jack in front of a client, right? Those types of conversations. I mean, you put Jack in front of a client and, and you know, makes everybody in the room feel small. It's true, Jack. Um, but this, this, these are the questions we have, I think, and we kind of internalize it. So um, I, I'd be interested in hearing other panelists' um, takes on that. But that's, that's my kind of take, which is probably a little different than where you were, you were heading with that question, but very relevant for me in particular as I um, navigate those waters and, and have a lot of support. But I still say, um, do, I, do I really have that support? Are they judging me? Are they saying, because you're a woman in IT and – you know, we're represent we're representing twenty five percent of the workforce. You know that there's some you know there's some implicit bias there, or am I expecting there to be kind of you know, kind of putting that on them before they even talk to me, right? That's, yeah. that's a good point, uh, Holly. Did you have something you were wanting to add there? Okay. Yes. Um, even though my um, last 20 years has been focused on um, procurement and equity and diversity and inclusion. But I am a mechanical engineer by background. So um, one of the stories that I will share is I took a different path because I got tired of fighting. And so as a woman in mechanical engineering, um, it was difficult in college there were a lot of women in the um, field and uh, three, uh, you know, there are very few that actually graduated and then there are even fewer. So there's like a filter that go on into uh, technical careers. And then that gets filtered over a career where you just see people opting out or pursuing um, other careers because it's such a hard fight. So uh, early on in my career, I remember um, doing one of my first presentations on a project, and it was to get money um, so that we could, a capital project so that we could get approval. So it was putting together the justification. After I gave the presentation, the comment was made was, you speak well. And um, I, I mentor a lot of young women and that kind of thing still happens today. So instead of focusing on what is the uh, issue at hand, um, I think it goes back to that bias piece that there are still a lot of biases where people don't understand why we would even want to do um, anything as it relates to technology and using a very old term as it's not our place. Um, and so we spend a lot of time convincing people, one, that we're truly interested, but then that we're really capable. Um, I've had other stories where I've seen, not in the work environment, but just in the community, when a technician comes in, um, it could be a plumber or HVAC or an electrician, and you can see people kind of, does she really know what she's doing? Um, and make those kind of comments. And as a person that was in a technical field, I would go, so what do you think about me to try to change perspectives? So from a bias standpoint, sometimes I think, you know, when we talk about conscious and unbiased uh, and, um, and biased, it is not that people know it, they just have never seen anything like us. And that was kind of the, something that fueled me is uh, one of my mentors said, um, then light yourself on fire and let them see you burn. So since they've never seen anything like you, instead of bearing a burden on your shoulders and holding yourself back, 
she said, just plunge forward because since they've never seen anything like you, they don't know what you expect. So you can probably get a lot of, uh, get away with a lot more than you think you can. And that's just kind of fueled me to take a lot more risk. And as women, you know, it depends on when you and where you grow up. We we're kind of taught to be polite. I mean, even today in meetings, I get teased because I raise my hand. My mother was a teacher and um, it's just the polite thing to do. And sometimes who we are gets mistaken for uh, weakness or inexperience because it's just different than what um, other people see. So uh, my advice to, to everyone is, you know, people don't know what you know. And so you can get away with a lot if you trust yourself and your capabilities, because as it relates to your topic and subject matter, ex your subject, even as a technologist, um, nobody knows what you know. And so that you surely can excel by giving your best, because that's all you can give. Well, thank you. You know, you mentioned mentors, and I've got a question here from uh, an attendee about, you know, you know, what can, you know, what can we do to help, uh, help promote, um, you know, diversity and inclusion. And, you know, you know, the topic of, of mentorship is a very, very interesting one. You know, I was very fortunate in one of my, you know, one of my first mentors as I was going through a, a, a t my technology career was a, a very strong and, and, uh, uh, very, very, uh, very passionate uh, uh, woman uh, leader in, in uh, technology, which helped me, you know, start to see some of that different perspective that was out there. Um, you know, I guess I'd ask the, you know, the panelists, you know, uh, what's the role of, uh, uh, of male mentors at, in, the, in the role of, you know, in improving uh, equity and inclusion? Can I yeah. take, can I take this one? Um, so as a scientist by training, uh, Holly mentioned she's an engineer. I'm a molecular biologist by training. And I've had mostly male mentors and wonderful male mentors. So, you know, when we have these conversations, this is not to negate the power or presence of men and great men who promote and advance women all day long, right? There is no question that I wouldn't be here, Holly, Amy, Lori, you, you can hardly be, and Pippa, of course, you can hardly be in any kind of STEM field and not have males at some point because there's just not enough female in real, you know, high level executive roles from middle to upper management. You're going to have some male mentors, but that does not negate the reality that there are still challenges and barriers that we face, even in 2020, that we shouldn't face, that you shouldn't still have to be fighting those same battles. And Holly's right, it, it does become exhausting and great talent leaves STEM, technology, engineering, because they do get tired of fighting. I can just say that I've been blessed enough and, and truly just um, blessed. I mean, it, it feels like a blessing to have two careers where I've had both male and female mentors who, guided me and helped me and steered me. This whole career I'm in now, I would have never known about, except Alicia DeCoudreau said, Angela, if you like science and want to be a lawyer, you got to be a patent lawyer. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. That's the thing. I mean, and then she's saying, go talk to the patent attorney, which was a bunch of men who I had lunch with and talked to, and they guided me and steered me and said, do this and don't do that. And you take all that Mentors are critical, especially for people who do not come from means, who have not been exposed. For me, I'm a little country girl from Kentucky. I didn't know anything about being a scientist or being a lawyer, but I had a mother who knew she didn't know and continued to push me out there to people who did know. Go talk to this guy. He's a doctor. Go talk to that person. They're a lab, and you you begin to learn. I mean, you make a career of learning. And I think that's what mentors and champions are all about. People who give you insight that you otherwise just could not have had, except that they've been a little further than you. They've had some experiences you didn't have, and they blessed you enough to give you some information that you can then kind of mobilize into action for your own life, your own career path. 
And for me, that's what I've been blessed enough to do. And so when you get an opportunity to have a platform, you give that back. You go back and give that, be that light, that information source for the people who look like you who otherwise wouldn't have that information and know that, oh, you can be a woman of color and be a scientist and then a lawyer and kind of make it up as you go along and it kind of comes out okay. And that you have to kind of serve that purpose. That's what my mentors have done for me and that's what I pray I do for other people. The, the, thing about, the thing about mentoring is that sometimes we ask people to formally mentor us, but probably 85, 90% of the time, we are mentoring without even realizing it. Right. And, and most of us are probably humble enough to believe that, you know, what is so special about my daily life? What is so special about my career? What, you know, and, and so we as women especially, take on that humility to a fault and and we're not as generous i think to to pass that along or to recognize the value in certain things um i'm i'm reminded of three uh three pieces of advice that i got pretty early on one was know the language of your company and of your industry and to holly's point you know they they were surprised that you spoke so well, right? Well, that's alarming that anybody's surprised, but that's reality, right? When you start speaking the jargon, um, then all of a sudden the ears go open and the eyes go open and, and all of a sudden you start leveling the playing field. That's why negotiating is so important. Even if you don't feel like you need it, as soon as you open your mouth for negotiating, it, it levels, it balances the conversation immediately. The second uh, piece of advice that I got early on is stop taking so many notes. You know, I learn by color, I'm holding a purple pen right now, I learn by color and location of taking notes. That is my learning. But someone along the line told me, if you ever want to be an executive, stop taking notes because it makes you look subservient to the other people in the room. Even though you're learning, they're seeing you taking notes like you have the most to learn or you're going to be in a support. That was a hard one for me to learn. So after meetings, I would go back and start taking notes just to keep my memory going. But, but it's impression. It's, it's about changing the optics of a situation so that it looks normal to people because what looks normal to people right now is not diversity. That's what looks normal. A crowd scene has 70 or 17% uh, diversity in a, in a crowd scene in a movie, and that looks normal to us. We have to change what looks normal. Here's the third piece of advice that has continually been a hard one for me to swallow, and that is stop cleaning up the dishes in a boardroom. Stop offering to take people's plate and silverware and all of that. I see that as just kindness, right? I, I get up, I'm going to the trash can, might as well help Joe and Jim and John. Well, that's your role as a woman, right? To red up the dishes. So we have to change the optics there. Those are very simple, kind of uh, slightly petty examples, but it's about changing the optics of the role of a woman. And in the world of technology, you know, I've had uh, IT groups uh, and science groups reporting to me for years. But what I found is when, when you're in the world of STEM, that world understands quantitative information. And sometimes uh, equity and inclusion feels like a soft topic, right? So, so in order to address it in the STEM world, let's take it into an objective place. So you measure your hiring diversity. You measure your compensation level for, the, for all of your employees. You point out the disparities that are easily measurable. Who got the promotions last year? Who got the raises last year? Who got to present in front of uh, equity partners? Who has equity? And, and soon you, you start, I mean, in, in Pippa's world, who went the fastest? Who placed? Who got the poll? You know, you start addressing these things with data, and all of a sudden you start to uh, change the minds of those of us who live in an objective world. And all of a sudden, 
it becomes a mathematical equation. Of course I want to hire you. Oh, and you're a woman? Okay, great. And so you, you kind of use that back door, you kind of use that Trojan horse approach to get through that. And, th and that's been my experience in the technology and science world, is if you can attack it through objective data, then it's kind of an advantage when you really want to have that meaningful conversation. But from my experience as well on sort of the motorsport world, while it's very different and, you know, I know I had the big talk sort of early on, but I do want people to understand that especially inside the paddock, things really have changed. And they've changed because when I show up to a new team who's never run a female driver before, and there's a little bit of like caution and uncertainty around me on the first day, I show up, I get the job done. I lead the team appropriately. By the end of that first day, I generally have an entire crew of people who want to work with me again. As an example, one of my crew guys last year, his name is Dougie. Uh, Dougie had you know, never worked on an Indy car before. He's a sports car bar guy. He had um, never worked with a girl before. Everything was new for Dougie. Um, and last year we put together this small team um, of misfits. For those of you who don't really know our story, it was a dirt team ownership uh, with a, originally a road course racer driving the car for this dirt team based out of Indiana, English girl driving for an Indiana dirt team. And because the dirt guys were busy with their schedule and most of the full-time IndyCar guys already work for full-time IndyCar teams, um, we pulled a bunch of guys from the sports car racing world where I do a lot of my other racing to come in and work on this program with us. And the support that those guys showed, Dougie was texting me just last week, do you know what we were doing this time last year? And he's sending me pictures of my seat fitting in the car. And he's telling me, you know, you ever want to go back to that race again? I'm, you know, you ever put a deal together to make it happen again? You need me? I'm going to make it happen. And that's what's been really special to me. So I can't say that in motor racing, I've specifically had mentors, but what's been incredibly different for me and is different for athletes of my generation and where I'm incredibly lucky is I've had people willing to help me. Not necessarily the same as mentoring, but people who are willing to stand with me, people who say, okay, I want to be with you when you do this again. And for me personally, that's a personal measure of success. But also, I'm trying very hard to try and help change the mentoring situation a little bit for other female racers in motorsport. Because in general, young male racers are able to find either retired older male racers or retired older ma male managers or people who are able to kind of help them and mentor them. And for women, much as sponsorship still a struggle, that whole sort of where do I turn and who do I go to thing is still kind of a struggle. So that's one of the big things that I've been investing a lot of my time doing is trying to invest in helping some of the younger up and coming drivers figure things out. Um, so, so that's sort of my two cents on the mentorship side is that help is just as important sometimes as mentorship and support. Even if it's somebody who's at the same level as you or in a slightly different field as you, that level of support and hey, I feel like you're doing a good job and I want to work with you again and let's figure out how to do this together to me is just as important as mentorship. Well, Pippa, I'm going to ask a follow-up. I've got a, a question here uh, in the Q&A from, uh, uh, from one of the attendees who uh, ha had commented how, you know, in the past you've, a you've, uh, you've actually advocated against a female racing league and was wondering uh, to ha if you would comment and address that. So, so here's the thing, um, separate but equal is uh, not equal in a sport where we can compete as equals. Um, the second thing is separate but equal but in slower equipment and with less pay is also not equal in the sport we've raced in. And the third thing is uh, separate but with not enough money if you win to graduate to the next level where you would also be racing as an equal again is also not separate but equal. Um, the other scary thing about that series is uh, it has actually, sadly and unfortunately, as predicted, started siphoning off money that could slash should be used to sponsor women in motorsport whom are really trying to head up the ladder 
it's now going to this one series. So currently as an open wheel racer in Europe, so if you want to drive an IndyCar type car in Europe, this is sort of the only place where there's any money for you. And there's only one or two racers whom have managed to not get sucked into that world. Um, we all want to make a living in motorsport, right? Male, female, it, it's something we all want to do. The one thing this series does is it does give women an opportunity to make a living in motorsport. I would completely agree with that. Um, but here's my problem, that that was not what you said you were doing. You said you were setting out to fund the ladder and if you really wanted to support women in motorsport, this money could be spent sponsoring a range of women throughout the various ladder series in Europe to help them climb to the top because the race car doesn't know the difference. I mean, heck, I race with a bright pink helmet and the race car still can't tell it's a girl driving. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, you know, one of the, you know, we've talked a little bit about how, um, some things have changed throughout our career. I've got a, I've got a question uh, here. Um, do we think that the tech industry is more accepting of diversity uh, in 2020? Uh, do, we, do we think we're more accepting now? Um, I would say absolutely. absolutely. Um, and I don't know if it's accepting or it's where we're tolerated. Um, now because we've proven, you know, what we can do and they're, they're just story after story in uh, technology where um, women have made a difference um, with support um, and without a support. So I'd like to share a couple of uh, quotes I think the other women that will resonate with. And one is from Oprah and she said, what do you know when you see um, a turtle on on a on a fence post. It didn't get there by itself. So you know when you, you when you talk about change, I think um, to uh, the point that was made that help matters. You know, a teamwork matters. But when people are supportive, whether they're a full fledged mentor. Um, I think it's moved from um, tol tolerance to genuine support. And I think that's what um, makes a big difference. And I know we're coming short on time, so I just want to share the other quote that I think embodies the change. For years, we were trying to get on a team, and now people are letting us play in the game. And it's not just letting us uh, play, um, we're taking our, our turn so that we can get in the game. And so it's kind of a two-way approach. And I think that's what's making uh, the, the biggest difference. And I'm not sure who brought up the point, but there's two parts. There's a barrier, barrier that people put up against us, and then there's the barrier that we put up against ourselves. And as uh, we grow and we see more women being successful, not just in technology, but from all aspects of business and career and, and throughout industry, you just see us grow and get stronger and stronger. And then we're reaching back up to make sure we can put the next turtle on, on the post. So it becomes a common theme and not something that you see you know, once, once in a while. Uh. On those, Ali, uh, back to mentoring for a second, um, related to what you were saying, is that when, when you go through the action of mentoring others, arguably the mentor is being lifted more than the mentee because you are forced to examine what is meaningful about what you've done, what is meaningful about your advice, what is meaningful about the people in your life that have lifted you up on that post, right? And so it, it creates this momentum of learning and sharing that I believe will ultimately pivot so that women can get about their day job and not get about managing. I mean, the Janet Guthrie example is she had very little brain space left to actually do her day job because she was managing all these other things. I look forward, and, and I think mentoring can kind of help shift that. It just creates this momentum so that we can all start thinking about our day job, being valued for our day job and get rid of all that minutia. Yeah, I would just add one thing to that. And um, I think it's really important, of course, to have mentors and to have help. 
But I also think uh, we as women, I'm, I'm generalizing, but we as women, we, we don't often help ourselves as much as men do. You know, and um, I'll, I'll give an example of this. Um, this is years ago, um, a mentor of mine, someone that I very much res respected and res continue to respect, said to me, um, "Amy, are you gonna are you gonna go in and ask for that that increase that you deserve? You're already doing the role." And I said, "Oh no, 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 no! I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna wait for them to notice that I'm." That, I, that I'm doing it. I'm going to wait for them. I, I mean, I'm sure they notice, but I'm going to, I'm just going to stick, sit back and wait for them to bring it to me. And, and she said to me, why? And then she just, just a little, little like nugget in my head, a little plant a seed. Amy, do you think a male colleague in your role, in your, at your level would do that? Do you think that they would, he'd walk right in and say, look, here's what I'm doing. Here's what I deserve. I'm going to um, go to bat for myself. And I went home that night and it was just hit me like a ton of bricks. And the very next day I went in and asked for that and, and got it, <laughs> you know, and I never would have asked if I didn't have that person who, who was a mentor, who was helping, but also was, was kind of pointing the finger back at me and saying, Amy, help yourself too. Right. Well, you know, to, to that point, Amy, I would say, and to Lori's point, I think there's also a um, opportunity, not just for women to support each other as mentors, but support each other in business. I mean, what Pip was talking about is sponsorship, right? She needs women to help, not just women, anybody, right? We'll take anybody's money. I understand, Pip. <laughs> But, but particularly women, to support women, right? I'm an attorney. If you want to make sure that there are diverse attorneys in the law firm that does your work, you better support diverse attorneys. You know, Holly, I've known her for 20 years, supplier diversity, all about supporting women and minority-owned businesses. Because if we don't support them, how are they going to manage? How are they going to stay in business? So it, it, it is beyond women just sitting on panels and saying, hey, I want to take you to lunch and coffee. It is about us getting serious about investing in women professionally, as business women, seriously, because that's the only way it's going to happen. And I think, you know, I think Pippa is a perfect um, example of just that. Yeah, I'm there, but I don't have the sponsorship to actually have a fair chance because I'm not even at the practice race. I show up and do the best I can do with what I have and we're happy with what, and, and just those things are unfair, you know, opportunities where we're cheering her just to see her there. And we don't know the backstory of all the inequities she's faced just to show up and put the pink helmet on, right? With the car that doesn't know any better. Like that's real. And I think, what I appreciate about these panels is that all of us have that story. We're here, but you have no idea what we had to face to show up, right? Or to be in that room or to be in that seat or to have that platform to tell our story. And those are the things that we can help support each other more on in a real, real way, not beyond the talk and the diversity statements and the feel good moments but the, the challenging moments where we say, you know what, I'm going to pick this person. I'm going to pick this, you know, entity. I'm going to pick this organization because not just will they do an exceptional job, but they stand for more than just that. You know, it's an opportunity for me to truly invest and make sure that another woman succeeds in a way that, you know, inspires the next generation. And I think that's what we're all at this point kind of commanded to do. You know, I, I got some gray hair up here too, Lori. I cover it well, but I got quite a bit actually. Well, I think as we're as we're starting to uh, 
uh, you know, get towards the end of our session. I think I've got time for, you know, one more question from the, uh, uh, from the attendees here. And uh, actually it, it, it's connected to those challenge, challenging circumstances. And, uh, you know, you know, we, we've talked quite a bit about that, you know, that first step of, you know, being, you know, showing up and, and being accepted and being there. Uh, but the question is actually about what happens when women make mistakes? Um, are they given chances in the same way their male counterparts are given chances? You know, what, how do we handle that scenario? And maybe how do we have those uncomfortable conversations about the lack of equity in that scenario? So I actually had this conversation, funnily enough, just the other day with a, uh, another woman who's actually on the sponsorship side of motorsport in the drag racing side. And she's currently trying to raise the money for a female drag racer to compete in Top Fuel Funny Car, which is the absolute top level of drag racing. And she said exactly the same thing to me. She said, how, how do I get this girl the same opportunity to fail? Because it's not just about having the opportunity to succeed. It's about having the opportunity to fail and being allowed to stand back up again. I actually failed. The 2018 Indianapolis 500, we had an issue with my car and I was unable to qualify for the Indianapolis 500. I couldn't believe it. I always thought I could outdrive anything <laughs> just about that my car threw at me to stick it in the show because quite frankly, I've done it before with a few cars that didn't really belong in the show. So, so it, you know, I thought I could overcome whatever and I couldn't. And I thought that was going to be the end for me. I thought that failing on that very public stage, that was it, done. And then in 2019, nearly all of the same partners, including Bell Tech Logics, came back and backed me again. And we put together a better program with better equipment and came home with the best result I've ever had at the Indianapolis 500. So since Janet, motorsport has grown to the extent where I have the opportunity to fail. But here's the big difference. I had the opportunity to fail once and it was in circumstances that almost every race fan who had an inkling of what racing is really about actually understood quite well. I don't have the opportunity to fail again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I screw up and crash a race car, very different things are said about me than if someone else screws up and crashes a race car. If my race car breaks and causes me to crash, very different things are said about that than if the same thing happens to someone else. And I see the same thing in business. It's just as important to allow women the opportunity to fail and stand back up on their feet, but I'll let somebody else take it from here for the more business side of it. <laughs> so, so I think that, um, business, the, the business connection to driving is, is very similar to what, what Pippa was just pointing out. The reality is that there are fewer women in executive roles than there are men. And it is not fair, right? But until it becomes fair, what do we do? We don't have as many opportunities. Right. Therefore, we all have to be trailblazers. Seems strange to even say that, but we all have to be trailblazers. Our reality is we either over prepare for a board meeting or we allow the momentum to continue in a negative way and not be distracted with what is fair and what isn't fair it just is it just is uh, the focus is on us to change the focus is on us to distract but that's also a huge opportunity because when the focus is on you because you're different you have a stage in an audience that the, that the majority doesn't have. That's right. That is a huge opportunity. And so it's, it's up to us to over-prepare, outperform all of those things, and eventually we, we will see that pivot happen. And I will second that, Lori, because I've lived that experience. I know for certain that my science career and my legal career I am both, I'm kind of a unicorn in both places, right? A, a African-American female scientist, an African-American female IP attorney is, is very rare. But I also, with that, I know that if I perform, 
if I really show out, I open the doors for all those other young girls behind me that, that also, like me, didn't know this was a thing, right? And also at my particular law firm and at the law firm around the corner and the, just being there and showing that it can be done by all the means that nobody thought you had. So, so, so to the po person's question, you're absolutely right. There is not as much room to fail. I absolutely feel that burden. Like I know that I'm blazing the trail and if I fail, I shut the door for somebody else and I won't let that happen. Mm -hmm. um, I, I will be the best I can absolutely be so that there's no excuses. You know, there's no, oh, well, that Angela Freeman, you know, we let her in and she didn't. <laughs> no, they're going to be like, oh, if we can get another Angela Freeman, right? That's what it has to be. So we don't have that room. That's just the reality of it. Fair, unfair, right or wrong. It is what it is. Take it and use it for everything is worth. That's, that's what I've done. And I've had great opportunities and experiences. And I hope, you know, the, the, the young girls after me don't have to, you know, walk, tread as lightly. Um, but, you know, that's, that's the, the hand we're dealt. And I'll take it and do everything I can with it. That's just what you got to do. And I'd like to add to your point is um, we've got to take calculated risks. So you can't be driven by fear. And that's right. uh, so it debilitates you. You've got to take risks, but it has to be calculated. So in the words of the women before me is don't do something stupid. Um, <laughs> but, you know, think about it and, you know, weigh out the wins and the gaps and, you know, you hope for the best, but you prepare for the worst. And that's I think right. the, that's advice that should lead you is don't be crippled by, you know, the burden and the judgment. Um, it's a reality. It's going to be out there, but um, the the best advice you can only be the best you that you can be. And so, if being your best creates a risk, you might learn something from the situation that where you're at might not really be best suited for where you should be long term. And that's a good lesson too. So um, you've got to take risk, and it just opens up the windows of opportunity when you do. Well, thank you, Holly and Angela and, and Lori and, and Amy. Uh, thank you all for a great discussion and a you know, special thanks uh, to you, Pippa, uh, for you know, your, your, your comments earlier. Um, you know, I'll, I'll share with everybody, you know, the, the, the discussion with this group has just been fantastic. We got on a call last week to uh, kind of prepare and you wouldn't believe just how fast, you know, the, the, the time flew by with, with great conversation. I'm sure we could go, uh, could, could go all night, but uh, uh, we also wanted to share with you and, and Jeff will be able to, to share this with everyone, um, just, some, uh, just some resources, some book recommendations and some other resources uh, that are out there um, on the topics of uh, of diversity and equity and inclusion and uh, you know we just encourage you to you know take you know take the time to look into these resources and keep this in the you know in, in the front of your mind as we as we move forward and uh, uh, and again thanks to all the panelists thank you uh, Jeff thank I guess I will uh, throw it back over to you for uh, uh, closing words all right thank thank you Jack and uh, to our attendees, I, I know our panelists can't hear you, but please join me in applause of thanking them, uh, thanking Pippa and thanking Belltech Logic. So thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Fantastic event. Uh, I tell you, Belltech Logics, you keep raising the bar every year. Uh, so this was fabulous. And, and Pippa, thank you so much for your words and uh, to our panelists, thank you for your time and your insights. It was, uh, it was an incredible discussion, and I really appreciate it. Thank you all very much. We'll be posting uh, the slides and the, and the video uh, on this as we get it processed, and I'll send out all the attendees a link to that. And uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening.